context that you can see how these three calls that come from heaven fit together. Also, you're able to now understand that there's a definitive and a distinct message from the Lord speaking to us and warning us about these things. People often misunderstand the reason why we do these lectures, that we're not just trying to expose the, the people or the systems, the false systems of worship. We are exposing them so that people can understand this is the requirement as regards the three angels' messages. We looked into the first angel's message where, where the, the angel called to acknowledge the everlasting gospel and worship him that is Jesus Christ. Through the law as the defining principle on how to determine what is good and what is sinful. We looked at, we're busy with the second angel's message. You remember the two aspects that make up Babylon? The two characteristics of Babylon, be it they were the Sabbath and they were the immortality of the soul. And that Babylon has three components that it breaks itself into. The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And we looked into the dragon and we saw the affiliations to the dragon. Well, let's look into the beast for a moment. Here you have Pope John Paul with his hand signals again, and also with the Dalai Lama, showing the coming of a world religion. It makes no difference if you follow the Dalai Lama or if you follow the papacy. It's the same religion at the top. People don't understand this. Also, when you look at the clergy of the Roman Catholic system, you see the hand signals of the inner initiates. They understand what they're busy with at certain levels. The Roman Catholic chief or the bishop as it were the pope is all things to all men doesn't matter if you are a hindu or a buddhist or a jew or a, a muslim these things up on the initiate side top initiates the, all the religions are actually the same thing for the cattle and the catechumen they're different marketing plans to get you to follow different ideas otherwise it wouldn't be possible for this image to be true here you have a pagan priestess putting the Shiva mark or the eye of Lucifer on the forehead of Pope John Paul. He is saying in this image that what he believes is the same or there's no contradiction to what this pagan priestess believes. Also that Pope John Paul kisses the Koran. Now the Koran, as we've shown in previous lectures, is a document that this proves Jesus Christ or he says that Jesus Christ it was appeared to he appeared to die but he didn't really die for us it was just made to appear like he died on our behalf and the Bible warns and says he that denieth the Christ he's got the spirit of Antichrist here you see him as an image of him as he's at the wailing wall the sacred place of worship for Judaism as I say it doesn't make a difference if you're a Jew and involved unknowingly involved with sun worship or if you're a Buddhist or a Hindu also unknowingly involved in sun worship or if you're a Christian or if you're a, a Muslim all unknowingly involved in sun worship somehow inside they're all the same thing and we've explained this in depth throughout these lectures you remember the sun symbol that they hold up which is called the monstrance as they walk through the streets and the symbols of the Queen of Heaven Mary the Queen of Heaven she's the one with a crown and she's the one with the child on her lap. This is the, you've got the two trinities, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And then you've got the false insider, pagan trinity of the Father, Mother, Child. And then on the Vatican itself, you remember on the papal crest, there was this image of the Vatiscan. Vatis meaning diviner and Khan being the divining serpent. This is the serpent that can predict the future etc vatican or vatican the divining serpent that's the foundation of the vatican and yet as we've showed you in the lectures uh, previous lecture with the bilderbergers and the media moguls the people that are controlling the information pope john paul is seen as the man of the year not only that i think his face appeared 16 times on the cover of time magazine alone John Paul superstar, triumphal return to the, the Pope in Poland. And when uh, Benedict was an appointed, it said on Time magazine, inside the mind of the Pope, how conservative will he be? How will he get, how he got elected, etc., etc. Understanding this man, this world leader, and driving his, his uh, 
profile ever higher. But there's a warning from heaven about this dragon and about the beast. And in 1986, a profound happening took place for the first time in history. Another first time. That's only 21 years ago, eh? 1986. This happened. Watch this video clip. I believe mankind took one giant step towards the uniting of all world religions into one at Assisi, Italy in 1986, where Pope John Paul II gathered all the leaders of the world's major religions to pray for peace. There were snake worshippers, fire worshippers, spiritists, animists, Protestants, Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus, North American witch doctors. As they walked to the microphone to pray, the Pope said they were all praying to the same God, and that their prayers were creating a spiritual energy that was bringing about a new climate of peace. John Paul II allowed his good friend, the Dalai Lama, to put the Buddha on the altar in St. Peter's Church in Assisi, and with his monks to have a Buddhist worship ceremony there, while Shintoists chanted and rang their bells outside. The final steps are being taken to form the prophesied world religion before our very eyes. 1986. Do you remember what happened in 1981? Reagan was the first president to face the obelisk. And three years later, full uh, channels were opened, diplomatic relations between America and Rome. And then two years later, Buddhists, Shintoists, Protestants, Catholics, all pagan religions, shamanists, everybody comes to Assisi in Rome. And there the Pope says that we are all bowing down and worshipping the same God. I disagree. As a Christian, I am not bowing down to the same God as the Muslim. As a Christian, I'm not bowing down to the same God as a Shintoist. As a Christian, I'm not bowing down to the same God as a Hindu. My God is Jesus Christ, and He's proved Himself over and over and over to be the true and only Savior of the world. And yet, this, this perfect image of Christ is being broken down, and He's now becoming just one of the team doesn't matter if you worship him or if you worship anybody else. And this was a, a function put together by the Roman Catholic Church, calling together the world's religions in preparation for a one world religion. Revelation 13 verse, verse 4 says, And they worshipped the dragon which gave the power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast saying, Who is like unto the beast, and who is able to make war with him? Do you read these words? Just read it carefully. And they worship the dragon, which gave the power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? This first beast, the Antichrist beast, is so powerful. Who is able to make war with him? Who is able to stop him? Even today, that's a fulfillment of prophecy. Who is able to make war with the Vatican without the rest of the world turning on him? Who's, uh, this is a fulfillment of prophecy. But they worship the dragon who gave the power unto the beast, and that's the cynical part. That's the, the poison, the rat poison in the system. And it says that all nations follow the beast. They all bow down. And on the 7th of April 2005, as USA Today explained, the church and the, the, the state at least bows to the church. Here President Bush, his wife, Laura, father, former President George Bush, Bill Clinton and Condoleezza Rice knelt in a pew in front of the body, bowing their heads. For the first time in history, the American governmental powers, the superpower of the world, in 2005, bowed down in humble acknowledgement of the Roman Catholic leader. These images were seen around the world, and they were a, a fulfillment of prophecy as have never been. When Pope John Paul died, who came into his place? Ratzinger, Cardinal Ratzinger, who became Pope John or Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. And one of the very first things he said here in Canada World, you see on top, here you see the image. It says Pope Benedict preaches unity during the papacy's first hundred days. This is the Edmonton Journal, Thursday, twenty eighth of July, two thousand and five. The unity theme, bringing all religions together, not only the Christian world together 
Remember, this is unity in error, not unity in truth. Jesus Christ wants unity. He says we're all baptized into one body. But he wants it a body filled with truth, not uh, compromising with error. This is why this 13, the number 13, is such a mystical and occult number. Because it's the combination of error and truth. The 6 and the 7 put together. It looks good, but it's got some rat poison in it. And the Pope is calling today louder than ever for the unification of all the world's religions. Here when Cardinal Ratzinger was put in as the Pope, he's being acknowledged. This is from the Romano, this is from their own documentation. World religious leaders applaud to Pope Benedict XVI during a meeting at the Sala Clementina at the Vatican. You see everybody's dressed in their dark clothes when he's dressed in white. And then just a couple of days ago, the 11th of July 2007, the Pope declared again that Catholicism is the only true church. All other churches are mere ecclesiastical communities. And they, the Christian churches have to come back to the mother. Not only did he do that, but at the same time he starts raising the Latin Mass. The Latin Mass was the Mass that they said at the same time that they were persecuting the people in the Reformation. Latin was the language that was raised, 16th century Latin was raised in opposition to the Reformation. And here the Pope is starting to develop his final plans to take control of the world. And there are going to be times where true Christians are going to have to stand through persecution, are going to have to withstand evil and error. And this is going to be pushed upon us. If you stand on the Bible and the Bible alone, you're going to join in with a group of people that are going to be outcast, as it were, in the world. Revelation 18 verse 4 says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and ye receive not of her plagues. You see, there's this call. Come out of her. In other words, don't have anything to do with her. You don't have to be in Babylon to be in Babylon. All you have to look into is your system of worship. Are there any traces of the DNA of the parental link between your church and Rome? Is there any acknowledgement if you did a paternity test in your church or in your religion? Is there any acknowledgement of sun worship or some acknowledgement of the papacy? If there is, come out of her my people is the call that goes into the world. Der Spiegel has this image of Rome, der ewige Stadt im Heiligen Jahr, this eternal city of Rome in the holy year of 2000. And it speaks about the Papst, die Kirche und die Sünde, the Pope, the Church and Sin. Revelation 17 verse 18 says, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Remember, this is the woman that rides the beast. This is the, the beast or the king power that allows another ten kings to, be, to, to receive power as kings with the beast. Well, that's the beast. We've covered the dragon, we've covered the beast. Well, what about the false prophet? Do you remember we went into this, this new liturgy style of being able to dance and sing in church specifically, which came from Vatican II? Put down your Bibles, don't read them, you don't need them. Let's clap and sing and then we'll get a feeling about how we can associate with God. Revelation 13 verse 11 says the following. And I saw another beast coming up out of the earth and it had two horns like a lamb and he spoke as a dragon. Remember this? This is the beast out of the earth. This is America, the prophecy of America. And this American power which was raised as a, a fledgling running away from Rome is going to speak like a dragon and take the world back to Rome. I'm going to run through some images. Bear with me as we just explain what we've been through. You remember the Google image that I showed you where the Capitol Hill and Vatican is on almost the same latitude? Not only that, they're an image of one another. Remember we looked at an image to the beast where the Capitol Hill is facing west and Capitoline Hill is facing east. By standing on the balconies of either building, they are actually facing each other with two obelisks in between. 
Roberto told us that there was a secret signal or sign that was to be given to the Jesuits worldwide when the ecumenical movement had successfully wiped out Protestantism. In preparation for a signing of a concordat between the U.S. and the Vatican, the sign was to be when a president of the United States took his oath of office facing an obelisk. Do you remember that? And from that time onwards, when a president said his oath and faced the obelisk, he would then basically be facing Rome. And throughout America's history, we went through all the presidential inaugurations. They were all done on the east portico, or the, yeah, the east portico of the U.S. Capitol. And on the 20th of January 1981, it was moved for the first time to the west front of the U.S. Capitol. And from then on, it's been on the west front. And from now onwards, uh, America faces Rome when she goes through her inauguration process of inaugurating the new president. And this happened with Ronald Reagan in 1981 when he put his hand up and he said his oath to the sun symbol or that obelisk. He's actually speaking directly to Rome. What happened after that? Three years later, 1984, Wikipedia says the United States and the Vatican establish full diplomatic relations. And there's a holy alliance that's opened up between Ronald Reagan and the Pope with his hand going, shh, don't tell anyone. There's a new movement underway to bring about the one world government, the one world religion. And we've got to bring America back in line with Rome. And then Chief Justice William Rehnquist, of all people, Chief Justice William Rehnquist in America, he says the following. The wall of separation between church and state is a metaphor based on bad history. I beg your pardon? The wall of separation between church and state is not a metaphor based on church bad history. It's based on the fact that people ran away from the persecuting power of Rome and they built the wall so that the beast couldn't get through. But that wall has to be broken down so that the, the church and the secular society politics can mingle again and the power, the second beast, can channel the world back towards Rome. Shock of shocks, November 14, 2004. Church and state merge under Bush. A complete reversal to the foundational documentation of the United States of America. And in between all of this, you've got uh, Protestant Baptist leaders like Billy Graham, who are spending so much time with the Vatican and with the Pope, busy opening up these channels. Billy Graham even called the Pope in, on April 2005 at the death when he, when he passed away. He called the Pope the moral leader of the world. Why would Billy Graham call the Pope the moral leader of the world? Have you thought about it? Well, he's got his own moral law, and that's the law that the world is going to accept, so he would be the moral leader of the, of the world. Makes absolute sense. Remember, we're looking at the false prophet. And I showed you how often we have to rely on prophecy to make sure that we understand where we are in time. And not only that, that we don't get trapped up with deception. You know, this deception of Satan where he's, where he's trying to get us to do things that aren't actually correct and accurate. Well, uh, one of those examples is the Passover lamb, where the priests that were sacrificing the Passover lamb didn't understand prophecy. They didn't spend time understanding prophecy. And they were uh, slaughtering the Passover lamb while Jesus was being crucified. If they understood prophecy, they would have recognized it. Today, the same thing is happening when the world's favorite pastor, Pastor Rick Warren, he says, if you want Jesus to come back sooner, focus on fulfilling your mission and not figuring out prophecy. He says that Jesus Christ, when he was speaking to the disciples and the disciples asked him, when are you going to come back? How will we know? what?" He doesn't say, well, you must look for this and look for that and be careful that no man deceive you. He says, it's none of your business. Jesus quickly changed the conversation. That's not true. Jesus didn't quickly change the conversation. Jesus wept because he said, you didn't know the time of your visitation. It's been laid out in the books. I've given it to you and you couldn't see it. And today, Rick Warren, the driving out this filth about don't look at prophecy. I mean, really. That's the one thing we have which proves that Jesus Christ is God. Not only that, he's taking Catholic theology to the world. People don't recognize it. But he says the first Reformation was about belief. This one, in other words, this Reformation now is going to be about behavior. 
The first one was about creeds. This one's going to be about deeds. The first one divided the church. This time it will unify the church. Rick Warren is one of the, the uh, main pawns in this big muddy bath of bringing the world back to Rome. He's one of the big string pullers, as it were. He's being pulled on the strings, but he's also pulling strings to bring people back in line. And how do they do it? Through liturgy. He calls his church is known as the flock that likes to rock. Don't leave your Bibles down. We don't worry about that. We'll have a feeling. We'll associate with God according to our feelings. And Robert Schuler, who's a 33rd degree Freemason, he loves and supports Bill Hybels and Rick Warren. They both come from his uh, institution. Robert Schuler said, it's time for Protestants to go to the shepherd, the Pope, and say, what do we have to do to come home? Please, we want to come home, Mr. Pope. We don't want to be Protestants out here in the cold on our own, standing on the Bible and the Bible alone. We want to come to you as our shepherd. Can you hear the angel calling? Beware, beware, beware. Babylon has fallen, that great city. Don't become part of this. Robert Schuller writes in his book, Self-Esteem, The New Reformation. To be born again means that we must be changed from a negative to a positive self-image. That's a lie. From inferiority of self-esteem, from fear to love, from doubt to trust. We can pray, our Father in heaven, honorable is our name. This is satanic. And Billy Graham speaks about jo Robert Schuller on his book. And he says he's got an amazing ministry. These people are hand in one glove. And Kenneth Copeland, do you remember I showed you all how they're, they're um, getting drunk on the Holy Spirit? I'm not going to show you all those video clips. If you haven't seen them, get the, the lecture entitled Signs and Lying Wonders. He says in his book, and I say this with all respect, so that it don't upset you too bad, but I say it anyway. When I read in the Bible where he says, I am, I just smile and say, yes, I am too. And my apologies, that's not from the book. That's from the Believer's Voice of Victory broadcast from July 9th, 1987. When God says, I am, then he just smiles and he says, oh, I am too. And his book, How to Build Your Firm Foundation, on it you can see the symbols of Freemasonry, the compass and set square. These people know what they're doing. Robert Schuller, who's a Luciferian insider Christian, he calls himself a Christian, but he's actually twisting Christianity back to Rome. He says, the most effective mantras employed the M sound. You can get the feel of it by repeating the words, I am, I am, I am, many times over. T Transcendental meditation is not a religion, nor is it necessarily anti-Christian. Oh yes, it is. Oh yes. It takes you down a path that opens your mind up to all types of influences which are anti-biblical. And all you have to do is look at the signal pictures and understand that these people are part of a bigger network. Billy Graham greeting Robert Schuller with a Masonic handshake on TBN. Also Schuller with Gorbachev. There you can see the same thing where even Gorbachev is somehow linked with Robert Schuller. And Benny Hinn who's just been to South Africa a couple of months ago. I was in one area doing these lectures and warning the people about these guys. And a couple of hundred kilometers away, Benny Hinn had flown in on his private jets and his helicopters and his limousines and his Hummer vehicles. And he had arrived there and he was having one of his crusades. Little do the people realize that he says, don't say I have, just say I am, I am, I am, I am. Call yourself God. Not only that, he often wears his Catholic regalia, hinting towards the fact that he's somehow guiding the people subconsciously back to Rome. And then he says things like this. Don't tell me you have Jesus. You are everything he was and everything he is and ever shall be. Don't tell me you have Jesus. You are everything he was and etc. Et I mean, this is satanic. Jesus isn't your savior. You are your own savior. You have the divine immortal principle within you to reach Godhood. We are evolving into Godhood. This is evolution at a different level. And then you have all of these leaders, image after image after image, showing the horned cornuto or the horned ha hand sign, the satanic symbol which we see infiltrating Christianity today. Handige klap kerse ikons in, it says in the, the newspaper Built in 2004. 
clapping of hands and, and, and uh, um, icons and candles. This has now become more commonly available and recognizable in the Protestant churches like the Engie Kerk, the Nederdeitsgereformeerde um, Kerk, that's the Dutch Reformed Church in, in South Africa, starting to see the elements of Rome coming into the church. Also that the foundations of these churches were built on the fact that the Rome was the Antichrist. They even call it, called it the Roomse Gefaar, meaning that's the Roman danger. They spoke about it. They preached about it from the altar. They spoke, be careful of the Roman danger. And these are the characteristics. And today, in 2004, the newspapers say, Katholieke Engie Kerk, jammer oor slecht, sê they. The, the, the Catholics are receiving an apology from the, the Dutch Reformed Church about speaking badly about them. It says here in the bottom, it says, um, tijdens sy verwelkoming het dominee Abel Pienaar van Skuilkrans daarna verwijst dat die katholieke die vers, verlede dikvuls die NG kerk as die roomse gevaar beskou is. Now they're apologizing for, for acknowledging the Dutch Reformed Church, acknowledging the Catholic Church as the Roman danger. Why are they apologizing? Is there any biblical proof that they've now uncovered which proves that wrong? Or is the biblical proof being covered up and now you don't have to read your Bible. You leave it behind and your Bibles don't have all the contents anymore. And now you can have handige klap and clapping of hands and liturgy to make sure that you feel your association with God rather than making sure that what you're learning is according to the Word of God. Another image from a different newspaper saying the same thing. Kerse en kruise. This als deel van kerkelijke vernieuwing. This is a religious a revival as it were got to do with uh, um, crosses and candles appearing in the churches. These are the Protestant churches. This is the wine of Babylon starting to come through, the false doctrines. And then here you have an interesting book, Die Belofte van Sy Wederkomst, The Promise of His Return. Have a look at the titles of the people. Here you have Dr. Lemmer Duplessis. He's the um, Afrikaans... Uh, Apostolische Geloofsending at least, the AGS, Protestant Church in South Africa. You've got the president of, the, of that Protestant Church, Isaac Berger. Nico Landman, who's the federal president of the PPK, that's the um, Pinkster Protestant Kerk, the Pentecostal Protestant Church. You've also got um, Anton van Deventer, who's the moderator from the Volle Evangelie Kerk, that's the Full Evangelism Church. These are Protestant churches. What did they say in this book? Let me read it for you. It says, the old covenant was annulled with the betrayal of Judas. That's interesting. It continues, those who still try to keep the law are not spiritually of age and have not yet received the Holy Spirit. If the law is still read these days, it must be for people that are not of age, that is for unbelievers. This is the only sense in which the law is still applicable today. Believers live through the Spirit and are not under the law. Believers that try to keep the law are in slavery, but believers that live in the fullness of the new covenant are free. Therefore, it is dangerous for believers in the church period to be associated with the law. Churches that read the Ten Commandments on Sundays in the assembly bring their members under the impression that they are still under the law and that they must try to keep the law. Isn't that incredible? This, these are the presidents and the moderators and the higher uh, vice pre presidents and, and um, I'm just looking here the one is a moderator the one is a, the, the president of the church and the, uh, uh, also a pastor of theology and he's a professor of theology saying that the law doesn't exist anymore we are now under grace what does that mean I can take your car keys please or can I go and sleep with your wife why don't you just take mine you know this idea that I can steal stuff today. Oh no, you can't steal. I can't kill you. I can't steal your stuff. But some of the law is uncomfortable. So then the whole law has to be done away with. This is satanic. And then Komlaton Singh, the Baal Haddad appearing in the, the Dutch Reformed books. Another part of the false, pro the false uh, prophet which we've discussed in the last couple of lectures was this gentleman, the prophet. I'm not going to play you the video. It gets me so cross. 
where the core principles of the throne room of God, that is the Ark of the Covenant, which was on earth representing the throne room of God in heaven, where he comes out as a self-proclaimed prophet and chops up the Ark of the Covenant, uh, breaks the Ten Commandments and the Aaron's rod, and he takes the mercy seat and he smashes it. These people are not fulfilling the word of God. Do you remember that we looked into the table and I showed you the, what's seen today in Pentecostals and charismatic churches around the world? Is exactly the same manifestation as what's seen in the satanic cultures and Kundalini Yoga and Satyayi and Subud and Qigong and Shakers. That these manifestations, you get the same thing in the voodoo worship in South Africa or in, in Africa where you've got this ancestor worship where they start to speak in tongues and they have shakings and all types of new spiritual insights and uh, physical jerks. All these aspects and one after the other after the other after the other. We realize it's exactly the same what they get in satanic pagan cultures you're getting in the charismatic and Pentecostal movement. There are the two tables. Read through them and test whether the experiences you've been through somehow are in line with what is experienced in pagan cultures. That's the first angel's message. That's the second angel's message. What about the third angel's message? Revelation 14 verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man, you see, here's the problem, worship the beast and his image and receive a mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest nor day or night, nor who worship the beast and his image, and, now listen, who receiveth the mark of his name. Here's a group of people, well actually two groups of people. One group that, according to verse 11, end up in the smoke of torment that ascends forever and ever. And remember we read about how we did a study on that, that's not the punishing that's forever it's the punishment and these people ni never ever find the rest in jesus christ ever again these people worship the beast now you don't have to bow down to satan to do this you just have to be involved in any of his systems of worship these people are involved in false systems of worship and they are deceived into receiving what's known as the mark of the beast but interestingly at the end it says who worship the beast in his image, and who receiveth the mark of his what? Name. It's got something to do with a name. And in the Bible, a name has to do with character. Jesus Christ is called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. He's got many names. He's called Michael, who is, which, which directly translated means he who is what God is. What about Jacob, the deceiver, who became uh, Israel the overcomer with this change of character and Saul who was a persecutor who became Paul the apostle a name has to do with association so here you are people that receive the mark of his name somehow they receive the mark of the name of Satan the character of Satan Revelation 13 verse 15 says and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead, that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. See, here you have this mark of the beast. Somehow it's going to be an implant that takes place if you refuse to bow down and worship the image of the beast. And if you don't, you're going to be killed. And this power, this antichrist power, this um, the second beast power causes all, both small and great, rich and bond, free and poor, to receive a mark in their forehead. Now what does it say? In their right hand or in their forehead. Please notice that. So you receive a mark. And it's somehow got to do with the mark of the beast. Now many people say, or come and ask me and they say, what is the mark of the beast? Because some people say it's 666. Other people say, no, it's a microchip or it's a barcode or it's a, 
The, the, the Antichrist is this big computer and the mark of the beast is the bar barcode on your shopping. Well, the thing is, you can't decide what it is. You see these images all over the world. Mark of the beast coming, this implant of the chip in the hand, biometrics that can now read your fingerprints, etc., etc. The literal view of the mark of the beast being this chip in the hand or the chip in the forehead clashes with the very next chapter. The Bible has to, in its totality, be in harmony with itself. It says in Revelation 14, verse 1, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sinai, and with him 144,000, having what? His father's name, where? Written in their foreheads. Here's a group of people with the father's name written in their foreheads. And just now we read about a different group of people with the beast's name, or the dragon's name at least, written in their foreheads. So there's two groups of people that each one receives a name or a mark or some sort of identifying seal as it were, some name to say I belong to God or I belong to Satan. So what's in the name that's written in the forehead of these people? What is in a name? Well, three things specifically. Firstly, a name is a claim of ownership. If I put my name on a contract, uh, say for example I'm buying a car and I put my name on the contract, I therefore acknowledge I own that car. So it's a claim of ownership. Secondly, it's a claim of character. I've just explained the name in the Bible is, a, is associated with character. And when you give your child your parents' name, they tell you, oh, I hope that they will be associated to the good characteristics of that such and such a person. If you love somebody and you say, I will name my child after them, it's because you want the same characteristics that that person has to be embodied in your own child. So it's a claim of ownership, it's a claim of character, and it's a claim of association. When you get married, the, the uh, norm is to have your name as a lady to be transferred across to ha accept the husband's name, and that is a, an acknowledgement or a confirmation of association. I'm now associated in unity with my husband, and therefore I accept his name, right? So what is the, if we got the mark of the beast, that's what everybody speaks about, the mark of the beast. It has to be, uh, di um, what's the right word, 180 degrees opposed to the mark of God. You've got the mark of the beast, so you must have the mark of God. So let's first find out what the mark of God is. We have to obviously go and ask the God what his mark is, and then we have to go and ask the beast what his mark is. You and I can't decide what the mark of the beast is. We must go to the beast and say, please tell us what your mark is. So let's first find out, please God, can you tell us what your mark is? Well, in prophecy, you'll remember that the word mark is interchangeable with the word sign or, or token. Often when it speaks about a sign in the Bible, it speaks about an alt, which is like a, a distinguishing mark or a, or a banner some sort of remembrance that you would hold up, a sign, something that you would put up above your head. That's an alt, a sign or a, or a distinguishing mark. So the mark of God is an alt, right? That's why Exodus 31 verse 17 in Hebrew is, uses that alt, Hebrew word alt. It says, it is a sign, an alt, a banner, a mark between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. The Lord is pointing towards his mark. What is it? Well, it's got something to do with, because he then goes into six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, and was on the seventh day was refreshed. So somehow it's associated with creation. You see, God's seal has to also have those three characteristics. Let's just change the wording. It still means the same thing, but it's from a different angle. God's seal or his mark, his banner, his distinguishing characteristics have to have his name, his title, and his territory in it. Do you remember this? We went into this into, in a previous lecture where we showed you what the seal of God was in the, mark, in the, the lecture, the, the seat of the dragon. Go and have a look at that lecture and then this will start to make sense. It says in the Decalogue on the fourth commandment, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Please notice what you see there. For in six days, number one, the Lord, number two, he made, 
And number three, heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is. There's his name, his title, and his territory. In other words, his ownership, his character, and his association. I am the Lord, the creator of heaven and earth. My name is God, my title is creator, my jurisdiction is heaven and earth, my territory. Otherwise known as, my, I'm the ownership, the ownership is the Lord, I, my character is the creator, and my association is with heaven and earth and all that in them is. And that's why Ezekiel 20 verse 12 is God's seal again. He says, moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign, an oath between me and them. That they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. Because there's going to be another Lord that sanctifies my people. He's going to try and he's going to give them a different day. But if you want to know how to, how to acknowledge whether they are my people or not, I will give them a, a different out, a different name or distinguishing mark, a mark of, the, of God. And that is the Sabbath to be a sign between me and them forever that they know that I am their Lord and not the different God. Okay. So if the Sabbath is the mark or the sign or the name of God, then what is the mark of the beast? Well, I can't tell you, and you can't tell me. Who's the beast? That's the first question. Once you know who the beast is, you can go and ask the beast, please tell us what your mark is. Well, throughout these lectures, we've come to realize that the beast is the Roman Catholic system. It is the, headed up by the papacy. This is the Antichrist beast. What is the Antichrist's beast's mark of authority? God's one is the Sabbath. Boom! That's my authority. It's the only commandment in the Decalogue where he stamps his authority. What is the place where the Roman Catholic Church stamps her authority? Guess. Let's ask him. Father Enright, American Sentinel. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day. The Catholic Church says, no. No. By my divine power, I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep holy the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience of the command of the Holy Catholic Church. Here is another one. Catholic record, September 1st. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible and the transcendence of, or the transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. You see, we have more authority than the Bible. The church is above the Bible. And the fact that we've taken the mark of God and turned it into the mark of Rome is proof that we've got more power than the Bible. Here you have one mark. Boom! There you have another mark. Boom! James Cardinal Gibbon, in this debate, when sometimes the Catholic Church is known to have said, well, no, we wouldn't have done that. And there's this raging debate whether they've really done it or not. James Cardinal Gibbon says, of course the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power. Here's the one authority, boom! This is the out, the sign, the banner, the mark, the seal that identifies me and God's people. Here's the banner, the mark, the seal, the out, the, the identifying characteristic that identifies Rome and her people. Here's the mark of the beast, boom! Here's the mark of God, boom! And they two die completely different, but they're so close. The one you either face west and you face the Sabbath in the sanctuary of God, you face Yahweh in the tabernacle as in the Holy of Holies, or you turn your back on the tabernacle on the Holy of Holies and you face the west and you bow down to sun worship. Remember, the mark of the beast has got nothing to do with Sunday worship. It's got to do with sun worship. The mark of the beast has got to do with realizing that the whole world is going to be involved in sun worship because it is through sun worship that Satan is channeling worship to himself. The Hindus will receive the mark of the beast because they're involved in sun worship. The Muslims bow down, or they got their mats out, which way do they bow down? And when do they bow down? To the east and morning and evening. They're involved in sun worship. And Christians today are involved in sun worship. And the theologians are fighting to say, the Sabbath has been done away with. We are no longer under the law. And rely on your feelings and your association and your closeness to God. Speak in tongues because that will help you realize that this is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. No, it's not the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Speaking of 
in tongues is given as a distinct language where I can today speak only three languages, tomorrow I can speak four. I can all of a sudden, out of the blue, speak Spanish. That is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. You see, the whole world is going to bow down to the beast. But yet, they're going to be deceived into receiving the mark of the beast. Just like a homeowner, when it takes ownership of the house or a car, and you seal the contract by signing on it. So Satan is going to seal the people by saying, these are my people. All of them are involved in sun worship. And God is going to say, these are my people. Bang. All of them have refused any association to sun worship. Please do not be deceived about the mark of the beast. It's got absolutely nothing to do with barcodes or chips in your hand. That is the rock that they're throwing in the bush to distract your attention away from the truth. The war in heaven was about what? Worship. So the mark of the beast has to do with worship. That's why Revelation 14 verse 9 says, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead. You see, it's got to do with worship. If you worship the beast or anything regarding the beast, you'll receive the mark in his forehead. And what does it say? Or in his hand. Look into that now. Revelation 14, 11, Who worship the beast and his image and whoever receiveth the mark of his name. That's the one side. If you worship the beast, you get the mark of the beast. If you, according to Deuteronomy, there's a different set of rules. It says there, Deuteronomy 11, 13 to 20. It will be, if you will listen carefully to my commandments, which I command you today, take heed to yourselves that your heart may not be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Therefore you shall lay up these words in your hearts and in your souls, and bind them for a sign and out upon your hand so that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. Here's this, this recognition that the Lord is kindling up a group of people who are going to have the commandments bound to their hand and as a frontlet between the eyes. What is between your eyes? Your cognitive thinking, the seat of intelligence of mankind. What is in your hand? It's the things that you do. It's your deeds. So here the Lord is referring to the commandments that your thinking is according to the word of God and your doing is according to the word of God. It's got nothing to do with implanting a, a microchip somewhere under the skin in your forehead. That's the deception. It's got to do with worship. That's why Hebrew 8 verse 10 says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put, the law, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. It's got to do with acknowledging the truth of Jesus Christ. Luke 24 verse 38 says, And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? Why do thoughts arise in your hearts? It's got to do with writing this law into your heart. The thoughts that arise in your heart, this inner voice. So you receive the seal of God by associating both your cognitive seat of the intelligence to the commandments plus your actions. You receive it on your right hand and as a frontlet between your eyes. How do you receive the mark of the beast? Read Revelation 13 verse 6. It says, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand, or in their foreheads now why is that important why is that important because it doesn't matter if you think according to god but do according to satan he's got you anyway or you do according to god but you think according to satan say for example i outwardly don't portray any adultery i'm keeping the commandments of god but inwardly my mind is sleeping with every woman that I see. I've got, I'm gonna, either going to receive the mark here or there. What about if I um, outwardly act like a Christian and I'm, I'm completely... Um, no, let me, let me turn it around. What if inwardly I'm a Christian? I study the Word of God. I'm a reverent. I'm reverent and I'm, I'm dedicated to the Word of God. But yet I break the commandments. Satan's got me either way. With, when it comes to the seal of God, you receive it on the hand and in the forehead. When it comes to the mark of the beast, you receive it on the hand or on the forehead. And that's why humanity is going to be deceived into receiving the mark of the beast. 
Because there's going to be Christians who are going to be thinking and, and being associated mentally with everything that God says. I feel like I'm doing right, but actually you're doing according to Satan. That's why the Ten Commandments are so important. Are you fulfilling every one of the Ten Commandments, or are you somehow involved in sun worship? Paul, writing to the Romans in seven, chapter 7, verse 23 to 25, says, But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. You see, I've got this tussle going on. I want to serve God with both my mind and my flesh, but there's a different law in my people. In my mind, they are serving God, but in the flesh, they are serving sin. Does this sound like people not observing the Sabbath? In their minds, they are acknowledging God as the creator and, and their savior, but yet they break the Sabbath. They are acknowledging with flesh the law of sin. In closing, I want to read with you Revelation 19 verse 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast into a lake of fire and burning brimstone. See, we're going to be deceived into receiving it. Deception is a terrible thing. The Bible gives us three clear warnings. The first angel's message, have the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ. Understand that judgment is come on the people and that we must worship the creator, not evolution. What about angel number two? Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. We've seen that. And angel number three, Revelation 14 verses 9 to 12. If you worship the beast or his image, you will receive a mark in your forehead or in your hand. Or those that worship God will receive the mark or the seal of God in the forehead and on the hand. Those that have this mark will drink, the, the mark of the beast will drink from the wine of the wrath of God. This is the message. And the, in closing, there's this supporting message of here are the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. That's why the seal can be on both the arm and between the eyes. Are we saved by keeping the law? No. By not keeping the law, will we be saved? No. If we are not saved by keeping the law, then how are we saved? We are saved by grace. This is righteousness by faith. By keeping the law, I'm not acknowledging my, my own um, legalistic tendencies. I'm acknowledging a higher power, a higher authority than myself. And by keeping the Creator's law, I am acknowledging the Creator as the higher authority. Jesus Christ is calling His children to come back to Him. And He's warning through His three angels' messages about receiving the mark of the beast. Go read Revelation 14 verse 12 and understand that the end group have got two characteristics. They keep all the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. The commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. And we together are, are looking forward to the blessed hope as it says in Titus 2.13 and the glorious appearance of the great God, our Savior Jesus Christ.